now we have our second speaker for today's session. Uh, that's Anton Alexeyev, professor at the University of Geneva. And he will speak about modular spaces, planar curves, and Baker Campbell Hausdorff series. So please, Anton. So hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. And I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, I gave a somewhat cryptic title. And um, I would like to start with a kind of map of the world, or maybe better say a chart of the world. So, um, so there are several very much interrelated topics. So you see, I, uh, I have here some kind of incomplete list. So, and those topics, they have um, kind of easy and hard questions. So just, just to tell you this easy and hard will be technically defined probably in the third or fourth lecture. And let's, uh, let's go along this list briefly. So the first uh, item is two-dimensional topology. And what is two-dimensional topology? These are intersections of curves, which turns out to be easy, or self-intersections of planar curves, which turns out to be hard. Or like the next topic is geometry, more particularly geometry of moduli of flat connections on surfaces. And there, uh, the easy part are symplectic or Poisson structures. And the hard part turns out to be some kind of exotic battalion Wilkowski geometry. So uh, similarly in Lee's theory, the uh, Baker Campbell Hausdorff series, which is mentioned in the title. This is a sort of easy part. And perhaps some of you have heard about the Duflo isomorphism between the center and the space of invariant polynomials. So maybe you haven't heard about it. So that's a difficult part. And then there are more topics like 3D topology, where invariance of knots turns out to be an easy part and so-called Dreamfield associators or solutions of the Pentagon equation, which is a bit symbolically written here as phi cube is equal to phi square. That's a difficult part. Then number theory, there is nothing easy about number theory, right? And there, there are so-called multiple zeta values, which is a difficult part. And finally, you see here some obscure pictures which is supposed to, to stay for some four-dimensional topology objects, some kind of uh, two-dimensional and one-dimensional uh, objects in uh, 4D topology. And they are here uh, on the hard part, some kind of zip unzip operations. So this is just to indicate that there are many uh, topics which are intimately related together. And um, in this mini course, we'll go through some of those topics and towards the end, you'll see some of those surprising relations, but not all of them. Uh, maybe now let me uh, show you the rough plan for the mini course. So what, what we're going, going to do. So, um, so we'll go back and forth between this page and the previous page. And today, normally, we'll be looking at this, uh, the so-called Goldman bracket and Thrive core bracket. And um, so this is uh, this is 2D topology. And normally, normally we'll see we'll see those things today. Of course, we we, we won't know why they're easy and hard, but at least we'll see what they are. And then tomorrow, you see, I also postpone until tomorrow the moduli of flat connections similar to Nikolai. So tomorrow we're going to see moduli of flat connections and we'll see some Poisson brackets and we'll see some interesting kitchen theorem speaking about uh, Poisson uh, relating Poisson brackets on duals of Lie algebras to Poisson brackets on moduli spaces. So, uh, so tomorrow we're going to see something in this, uh, in this part. Uh, then you see now the plans become less and less definite for lecture three. 
I was thinking to talk to you about Greenfield Associates and the so-called Kashivara Verne problem in Lee theory. So that would be, um, that would probably be this topic and that topic and possibly this topic here. And finally, in lecture four, I plan to put all those things together and see the links between them and maybe explain uh, some other directions. Maybe, may, maybe I, was, I was hoping to, to say something about this BV part since we are focusing a little bit on modular spaces in this school. And then uh, also say, what are the open questions? in the field. So this is just to, to give you a perspective of uh, what's going to happen. Maybe now some more comments. So as you see, so in uh, lecture one, we'll be doing 2D topology. In lecture two, we'll be doing geometry. In lecture three, we'll probably be doing something like algebra. So here will be geometry. Here something like algebra. So in particular, uh, I hope that to some extent, uh, the lectures of course are, are related to each other, but they are also to some extent independent as well. At least I'll try to design it in such a way. So if today by the end you, you get completely lost, tomorrow we start from scratch in some other direction. Of course, in lecture four, we will have to make all the ends meet, hopefully. So, so then we will be combining things together. Also, at least during the first three lectures, my ambition is, uh, since it's a school, to, to prove at least something in uh, each lecture. I don't know how, how it's going to work, but at least uh, we will we'll try. Now, the, the final thing, you see my prepared slides, they end here. And I actually would like to... Uh, would like to create the slides just in front of you. Uh, there are some risks in it, but then also like uh, maybe you tell you, you give me feedback towards the end. I can also prepare slides before, but I think it's more fun when we do the, when, when we write things together. So, um, so in lecture one, we'll be speaking about the golden bracket and drive core bracket. And um, to start with, we need a little bit of, um, uh, of definitions. Let's say sigma will be a compact, connected, and oriented to manifold. And, and here, well, about the boundary, in most cases, I will assume that the boundary is non-empty, but it's not, it's not an absolute thing. Perhaps sometimes the, the, uh, the boundary will be, will be empty. So one can imagine a surface, something like this. And well, of course, we have a genus G and um, the number of, uh, boundary components and and well I'll use the notation n plus one uh, because it's kind of convenient of course sometimes the number of boundary components is zero and then well uh, my notation doesn't doesn't work so well so we'll be interested in the fundamental group of this surface uh, and typically, we're choosing one of the boundary components. Let's say the boundary component is number zero. So let's enumerate them from zero to N. Uh, the boundary component is number zero and we, we fix a base point on that boundary component. Um, right, so uh, note that if, uh, uh, if we have some boundary, then this is a free group. of rank to G plus N. Now we also fix K a field of characteristic zero. And in most cases, 
this will be R even more often it will be C, even though topologists typically they would like to have to, to have it the field of rationals, but that doesn't matter so much. So now uh, a very, very important object that we'll be looking at today is the following vector space. So to, to such a surface, we associate a vector space and this vector space, I'll give you several equivalent descriptions of it. So um, it's a linear span of the uh, of uh, homotopy, homotopy classes of uh, free oriented loops in sigma. So this is a kind of topological description. You can imagine that you have a curve uh, in sigma and you consider it modular homotopy, it's oriented. So you can then add or subtract uh, such, uh, such gadgets uh, with some coefficients from K. Uh, it's actually the same as the K span of conjugacy classes in the fundamental group. So you see what you can always do, you can attach, well, maybe I've chosen my base point, not very wisely, let, let it be here. So you can always attach, you can always choose a path and attach your, uh, you attach your loop to the base point, Right, of course, uh, this is the modular conjugation. If you choose a different pass, you will get a different element of pi. So, uh, so those homotopy classes of free oriented loops, that's the same as conjugacy classes in the fundamental group. Uh, finally, um, there is um, yet another more algebraic description. You can say that you take the group ring of your fundamental group and you divide it by the vector space of uh, commutators. So note that this is not an ideal. You're just dividing it by expressions of the type AB minus BA in the group ring. So the resulting object is just a vector space. Um, perhaps um, here I would also need a little bit of notation. Um, so there is, uh, uh, a canonical projection from uh, the group ring to this uh, quotient by commutators. And um, I'll denote it by absolute value. Sometimes people denote it by trace. Uh, perhaps I, uh, I prefer to denote it by the absolute value. And uh, perhaps I'll continue with a couple of examples just, uh, just to make it a little bit less abstract. Uh, so, um, oops, sorry. I think I created the page in the wrong place. Okay, right. So, um, so some examples. In fact, there are two basic examples in the game. So one example is a sphere with three holes. Do you recognize it? So the surface is here, right? And uh, one hole is outside and two holes are inside. Um, let me choose the base point on the outer boundary. And uh, well, I can choose the generators of my fundamental group like that gamma one and gamma two, will work a lot with this uh, picture over these lectures. And so pi is isomorphic to the free group with two generators and these generators are, for instance, gamma one and gamma two. So now let's, uh, let's write some elements of this G of sigma. 
Um, right. Of course, I can I can write I can take an element gamma one, and I can consider the corresponding conjugacy class or the corresponding curve, or I can take an element gamma two. But maybe more interestingly, let's uh, take something like this: gamma one, gamma two, uh, gamma one, gamma two minus one. Right, so I took uh, an element of pi, some kind of relatively complicated element, and the uh, since uh, since these are conjugacy classes, I can do as if it were under the trace. I can, for instance, reshuffle gamma two minus one instead of being the rightmost to be the leftmost element. Um, so perhaps one uh, one remark. Uh, already in this example, uh, this g of sigma is huge, right? That basically you write any words in those letters: gamma one, gamma two, gamma one minus one, gamma two minus one, and the only thing that you can do is this cyclic rotation. So it's even not completely clear how to how to write a good basis in this space but it's clearly a very infinite dimensional vector space. So that's, uh, that, that's how it looks like. So uh, maybe um, another example. Uh, so here I will try to draw another surface and it also goes a little bit in the same direction as uh, Nikolai was explaining it's a torus with one boundary component. Uh, I'm choosing my base point here. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. Now uh, the fundamental group is again a free group with two generators. For instance, I can choose them to be like this, let's say alpha and beta again pi is isomorphic to F2. There are two generators, but then of course, when we add more structure, we will see that uh, the topology of the surface, it, uh, it tells us something about what's going on. So, uh, so, the, uh, so this G of sigma, these extra structures, they will be different. But for now, just as a vector space, uh, they look the same. Uh, maybe one remark. So the space G of sigma, uh, so here already in those examples, that's uh, some kind of relatively unmanageable gadget. But um, if you consider a closed surface, a torus, in this case, uh, G of sigma is manageable and it is um, actually, now we can give a basis. It is spent by uh, generators gamma MN, where M and N are integers. And uh, here, uh, gamma MN simply are uh, elements of uh, H1, of the surface with uh, Z coefficients. So in other words, you can represent them uh, by curves, which go say M times around one of these cycles and then N times about the other cycle. So uh, sorry for the drawing, which is maybe not, not very, uh, very careful, but uh, clearly you can have a cycle which winds n times around one of the uh, one of the cycles of the torus n times around the other, and that's all what you have. Right. Okay. Um, very good. Now we introduce probably one of the main characters um, of this mini course, and maybe of some other mini courses as well. So uh, it's called the Goldman bracket. So what is the Goldman bracket? So let me 
make a drawing. So the golden bracket, well, sometimes I'll write Goldman, but maybe in some cases that would be too, too cumbersome. So this is an operation which goes from the second wedge power of uh, G of sigma to G of sigma. Uh, let me try to draw two curves. Say like this, right? So this will be called gamma one. This one will be called gamma two. And um, we write a bracket of gamma one, gamma two. Here I write absolute values just to remind ourselves that these are elements of G of sigma. And uh, so here is the right hand side. I will write the formula and then I will introduce all the implementation. So, um, so this is a sum of the intersections of gamma one and gamma two. Here there will be some sign and here there will be something that I denote gamma one hash p gamma two. Right, so what, what about this notation? First of all, um, first of all, um, we choose representatives gamma one and gamma two such that they intersect at a finite number of points transversally. So uh, that, that's always possible. So we want gamma one, gamma two to be a finite set of transverse intersection points. Okay. Now, uh, what is this? Um, what is this gamma one uh, hash p gamma two? Uh, locally, the picture looks like that, right? So we have two curves and they intersect and here is sitting this point P. And we go to a resolution of this singularity, right? So uh, topologically speaking, we have here a singularity, these two curves intersect and we are replacing this picture by such a picture. So there is a unique way to do it if you preserve orientations. And uh, out of two curves, you always get one curve. So that curve is called gamma one hash P gamma two. Of course, if you have several intersection points, doing it at different intersection points in, in general, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I should probably follow more the, the questions. Yeah, we consider, we consider smooth representatives. Yeah, there, there is a question on the chart whether we pick uh, smooth curves. Yeah, we consider smooth representatives. That's right. So, um, so that's, uh, uh, that's this um, resolution. Uh, now, finally, um, finally about design, um, what is epsilon P? Let me again um, redraw the picture. So here is the picture. And uh, at, the, at this picture, we can consider the tangent vectors to the two curves. So this, these tangent vectors, they form a basis uh, in the tangent space to, um, uh, to, to the surface. at the point P. And this basis has an orientation. So in comparison to the orientation of the surface, it's either plus one or minus one. And so we can um, uh, we can 
uh, define epsilon p as the uh, as the computer as the orientation of the basis e1 and 2 uh, compared to the orientation of natural uh, chosen orientation of sigma so now we defined uh, all the things on the right hand side uh, and here comes here comes the serum due to Goldman. I must say, um, by now everybody is used to it. I'm not sure, I guess it was a very surprising fact to start with. So, so this operation is a well-defined Lie bracket on G of sigma. Now, uh, in fact, so we have basically here three statements or maybe four statements. Uh, first of all, right, it, it should be bilinear if it wants to be Lie bracket. Here, I even wrote it just uh, on uh, classes of curves and it extends bilinearity. So this bilinearity is implicit in my definition. Now, uh, the skew symmetry. This Q symmetry is obvious. Um, so, so the statements are bilinearity. And this is sort of okay. Skew symmetry is obvious in the definition because the only thing which depends on the order of gamma one and gamma two is this um, orientation of the basis E1 and E2. There is nothing else in the formula which depends on which curve is the first, which curve is the second. So if you switch them, the orientation changes. And uh, so you get an extra minus sign. So this Q symmetry, this Q symmetry is obvious. Now what remains is uh, Jacobi. And uh, not to forget, right? It's uh, well-defined. In fact, uh, well-defined, I don't attempt to prove, but maybe I, sh I, I can ask you to do some kind of homework. At least for those of you who never seen those golden brackets, just think about it. Why, why is it well-defined? After all, we can choose very different representatives, right? So uh, the same homotopy class, but maybe representative is very different. So we, we are saying that the Goldman bracket should be uh, should be still the same. So um, um, uh, instead, I will show you a little bit of an idea of a proof of Jacobian. Right. So, um, so in Jacobi, we need to do um, something like this, right? And then we should go, uh, we should do, we should add to it, uh, we should add to it, say, Right. Plus, there is a third term. If I do the drawing correctly, maybe we don't need the third term for this um, for this calculation. So um, let me try to to draw in uh, three different colors. So this will be gamma one. Um, this will be gamma two, and this will be gamma three, right. So, uh, so the first the first term, it tells us to first take a bracket of gamma one and gamma two. 
So this means this will be a sum of uh, intersection points between gamma one and gamma two, at least when we chose well the representatives. And now uh, we have only one on the picture, right? So we have no choice. And uh, so the, uh, uh, the picture will become like this, right? This is now the same curve. And it is, it is uh, intersected by, by this curve, um, right? So uh, maybe let me draw, let me say here. So it is gamma one, um, right? And this was P, okay. Uh, now, what was the sign? What was the sign of uh, this thing? Um, uh, I think the, let's say the surface had a blackboard orientation, which means uh, from the first to the second, you need to rotate counterclockwise. And I think here I get, uh, I get clockwise for my two tangent factors. So this one and that one. So the, the sign is actually, is actually a minus one, right? So now um, there will be uh, two contributions, right? In the, in the bracket with gamma three because there are two intersection points, but I want to focus only on one of them. The consideration for the, for the other one uh, would be similar. So let me, let me do, for instance, this one. Now the result, the result in curve, is, well, sorry for my drawing degenerating, right? So that's, uh, that's the resulting curve. I resolve that red intersection point. And now I think the rotation is counterclockwise from blue to, to green. So, uh, so this was um, the intersection point, let's say P prime, and um, epsilon p prime was actually plus one. So I got that picture with a total sign minus one, right? Here. But now, uh, now let's look uh, at, the, uh, at the second term, right? In the second term, I should start with a bracket of gamma three and gamma one. Right, so um, right. So here, what will happen? I will have uh, gamma three, right, and uh, so gamma. So this gamma two is not touched; it is still here. And uh, here, there will be. Oops. There will be such a picture, right? So that's uh, that's the gamma gamma three with gamma one, and the sign I think for uh, now for this. Um, uh, let me choose another color for this one. So p double prime. I think the sign there uh, is um, again a minus one. Epsilon p double prime is minus one. Uh, and in order to compare, I would like to, to, to now, again, there are two terms. I only consider one of them, which corresponds to P to obtain uh, comparable, comparable pictures. Of course, here the picture will be, uh, sorry, maybe I, I, I better just draw, draw the line, right? So the picture will be just like the one in, uh, in, uh, in yellow. Uh, but um, but now epsilon p now epsilon p is uh, yeah it's still minus one right so I'm getting the picture in yellow with the sum of two integers one of those integers is minus one times plus one and the other one is minus one times minus one. So, well, uh, I mean, let me just write it. Minus one times plus one plus 
minus one times minus one, well, it is equal to zero. And uh, that's how you see the Jacobi identity. So basically you see it's uh, very, very uh, topological. This is an algebraic identity, but it simply comes from uh, this, uh, um, from this definition in terms of um, intersections of curves. And now it, it just follows that uh, when you do the Jacobi, the signs will come up in such a way that they will cancel for all the terms. So of course, it's not a proof, but it's an illustration of how the proof works. So uh, think about the uh, uh, well-defined, whether, whether the bracket is actually well-defined. Of course, it, it's also a somewhat similar consideration. I encourage you to look at it. And uh, I will continue with some um, small remarks about the properties of the Goldman bracket. So the remark number one, uh, there is mm, uh, a special element in this uh, G of sigma. And this special element um, corresponds to a curve which, have it, which has a trivial homotopy class, right? It's simply a contractible loop. Now, um, a simple claim. Uh, so this element belongs to the center of G of sigma. Well, uh, why is that? Imagine that you have uh, a, your curve gamma and somewhere it intersects, um, it intersects this, um, uh, this, red, uh, this red trivial curve. But of course, right, everything is up to homotopy. You can simply move this trivial curve and draw it here instead. Now there are no intersections. And, and of course, uh, you know, uh, in the Goldman bracket, the right-hand side of the bracket is a sum of the intersection points. Now we believe the Goldman bracket is well-defined. Uh, so we change the representative. Now there are no intersections. This means the Goldman bracket is zero. So it is central. Uh, moreover, uh, I, I would like just, uh, it, we, we don't need it that much, but uh, still I think it's interesting to, to state what's the, what's the center. So what's the center uh, of uh, this Goldman Lee algebra? And the proof, by the way, it uses uh, Poisson geometry. There are now also algebraic direct proofs, but the original proof uses Poisson geometry. And the statement is as follows. So the, the center of G of sigma is equal to the linear span of, um, powers of certain curves. I will tell you in detail what those curves are. The K is an integer and gamma I is a boundary curve. So in other words, suppose you have a surface and it has some number of boundary components then you can single out the curves which go once around the boundary. Of course, you choose orientation. You, you go either one way or the other way. So let's call this guy gamma one and this guy gamma two. But then what you can actually do, right? You can go around that curve several times. So, and that's what I denote by gamma i to some power. So, so those curves which go around the boundary, they are central. Again, for the same reason, essentially, you can put them closer and closer to the boundary and there would be no intersections with, with whatever curve uh, you draw inside the surface. Uh, so this is not quite a direct sum, 
in the center because if k is equal to zero, you always get a trivial loop. So all the trivial loops are, are, are the same. Right. So that's just an interesting fact. And um, so this uh, maybe a couple of words, this golden bracket. So next time we'll see, or maybe also in the Collis mini course, I'm not sure, but we'll certainly see how it is related to modular or flat connections. So this is, uh, this is a gadget which is classically, fundamentally related to modular of uh, flat connections. Uh, now I will show you a very similar topological construction. And uh, for a long time, it was not quite known how it, sorry, I always do it wrong, yeah. So it was not quite no, known how this is related to modular flat connections. Perhaps towards the end of the mini course, we'll see it. But uh, topologically, it looks very, very similar. So this goes under the name of a derive core bracket. And here the idea is, uh, we start with one curve and we want to make out of it two curves. So uh, let me again start with a drawing. So that's one of our favorite uh, oriented surfaces. And let's say, gamma will be a curve, an oriented curve. And here you see, I want to draw it with some self-intersections. And in particular here, there is one, one self-intersection. So, and I should say, what is delta of gamma? And uh, let me write a formula. So here, let me use a somewhat funny notation P in gamma intersection gamma, but of course here I only I only mean uh, not 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 really I, I I don't count when that's the same point on gamma. I want uh, transverse self intersections mm -hmm. of uh, my representative with itself as shown uh, as shown on the picture. So the notation is a little bit funny, and here I I have. Uh, Again, epsilon p, gamma p prime, veg, gamma p double prime. Where what is gamma p prime and gamma p double prime? Uh, now, if I again use the same resolution, so what would it be here, like this, right? So if I use the same resolution of singularities as before. Uh, so what will happen? The curve will always split in two parts. So there will be two connected parts. Uh, let me call one of them gamma p prime and the other one gamma p double prime. Actually, I can choose whatever order I want. Now the question is what is epsilon p? Here, I, uh, let's say, suppose I take uh, for, the, for the first one, the outgoing vector, and for the second one, I take the outgoing vector. This gives me again a basis. And as before, I say that epsilon p is the ratio of orientation, is the relative orientation of that base with respect to the orientation of the surface. Now, if you replace, if you now choose gamma double prime as gamma prime and the other way around, you will change the sign, but you will also change the sign in the wedge product. So actually this is a well-defined prescription. So you see, it's a very, very similar construction. And there is a theorem due to 
to Rayev, and part of it is due to Charles. And um, as usual, when I speak about that theorem, I first give, uh, it's very anti-pedagogical, I give a wrong formulation. So I, I apologize to the authors and I apologize to you. Uh, but, and then I correct. So I promise to correct. Um, so, um, so the theorem says that uh, uh, several things, the delta, is a well-defined map. And it says that um, G of sigma the golden bracket and drive core bracket. Uh, so this is a structure uh, and it's called an involutive Lie algebra. I don't assume you ever heard of those involutive Lie algebras. Let me just briefly, maybe not, not in great detail, tell you, uh, tell you what this means. So this means uh, several things. So there are some kind of axioms. And of course, the first axiom tells you that So the Goldman bracket is a Lie bracket, which we know anyways, right? Then uh, the second thing tells you that uh, Delta Turayev is a Lie core bracket. Well, you know, um, Delta maps G of sigma to wedge two G of sigma. And if we pretend that G of sigma is some kind of well-behaved, say finite dimensional, which it is not, but uh, if we pretend that, then we would have a dual map, right? So uh, delta B in a Lie core bracket is equivalent to delta star if it existed to be a Lie bracket. So you can figure out what kind of you can impose an axiom on delta, which would be which would be saying exactly that. So this 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 should be a Lie bracket. Um, then um, there is an axiom which may look a little bit funny. Uh, to you, but which maybe at some point we, we would even use. So in fact, delta and the bracket, they are talking to each other. And they are talking in the following way. So uh, this is U delta of V minus V delta of U. And now let me make a quick check uh, with you. So, um, I mean, are you sleeping or you're not sleeping? So what does it actually mean, right? So here I'm writing U bracket with delta of V. Does it make sense to you or what, what would it possibly be? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, in more, and a bit more detail. I'm okay, so... it's Houghton bracket. Yeah, okay, it's Houghton bracket, or let me maybe in case some people don't know what Houghton bracket is, right? So this is something like this, UA, B plus A, UB, right? Or minus, plus, plus, yeah, I think plus. Okay, finally, there is this word involutive, and this is actually, that, that observation is due, due to chess. Uh, so um, when you take a composition of the bracket and the core bracket in this order, you first use the core bracket and then you apply to the image the bracket, you get zero. So this is the involutive word. Right. So you see that there are many, many axioms. 
but um, in principle, you can you can basically check all of them. Similarly, how we started checking the Jacobi identity for the golden bracket. This is all about in those intersections of different pieces of the curve and how the signs uh, conspire together to get zeros in the end. So, so basically, these are of course some kind of algebraic formulas, but it's all about this topology of intersections and self-intersections. Now, as I said, uh, in fact, the theorem as stated is simply wrong. So uh, probably there are specialists in the audience, but then maybe someone who didn't know the answer before, do you see where, what's wrong, right? This, this theorem is just plain false. What is false? So the theorem is false and tell me, what do you think is false, right? There are many statements. One of them is simply doesn't work. Any ideas? I think uh, delta dual may not exist. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah that, 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 that's true. But uh, the delta dual, I mean, depending on what kind of dual we consider, but that's that's not a problem. You, I just uh, kind of, this was to simplify the explanations. I didn't want to write the, the axiom. In fact, um, the, uh, well, I mean, so this is simply wrong. Fortunately or unfortunately, make it interesting. Actually, delta is not well defined, as I stated. So, and this is relatively easy to see. That's because suppose I, I do something like this and there is nothing inside the loop. So this loop is contractible, right? So in particular, uh, on the right-hand side, there will be epsilon P times, uh, this, which, this, plus maybe some other stuff. But, but this is a priori non-zero, right? I mean, something. So there is some, some curve. And uh, at least if the homotopy class of this left side is non-trivial, right? Of course, if it's trivial, then trivial, which trivial is zero. But if the homotopy class of this, uh, of this other curve, which can be anything, to be honest. So it's non-zero. So there are, two, um, there are two ways to deal with it. So one way to deal with it, uh, which is canonical, you can consider G of sigma modular the one-dimensional subspace spent by trivial loops. Well, since uh, remember we, we discussed in some detail that this trivial generator is central, this means that this is still a Lie algebra, right? So the golden bracket is still fine. And then it turns out that, uh, that the theorem is uh, as stated above is correct for that space. Because now the trivial loop is just zero, right? It's in the quotient. So this extra term on the right-hand side, it uh, doesn't bother us. Um, there, is another, mm, uh, there is another way, and I would like to briefly, very briefly uh, speak about it because perhaps we would need to, to use it. So um, the other way is as follows. Suppose that uh, now we really need the boundary to be non-trivial. In this case, the tangent bundle of the surface is actually trivial. So it's isomorphic to R2 times sigma, but it is isomorphic to R2 times sigma in many ways. Such a trivialization is called the framing.
Now, suppose you have a curve. Given a framing to a curve, you can associate the rotation number. Right, because you, you have a more or less, you can introduce if you want a basis in your tangent space, and you're simply looking how many times your tangent vector to the curve rotated when you go around the curve. Right? So you you have your curve, and but you you have at each point a fixed basis, right? So you you actually know how how your curve rotates. Right, so you have a, an integral rotation number. And now what you can do, you can say that for each representative, so for each curve, you will be adding some number of those uh, small, small loops in a good direction, such that the rotation number would be zero. So, so we now only consider uh, to write core bracket for curves with rotation number zero, and uh, this makes uh, this makes the whole story well defined. Now everything, now everything will be fine. Here in the wedge, you will be also adding some number of those rotations. So 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 this uh, this fixes the situation. Uh, however, what happens? In principle, this delta would, would start depending on the framing. So you're getting the whole family of Levi algebras. The Goldman bracket is canonical, but the core brackets, they will depend, uh, depend on the framing. So um, my time is uh, about to end. I would like to, uh, to go back to the um, to this chart of the world, and and now we've seen we've seen the um, um, Goldman bracket with intersections of curves, to arrive core bracket with um, self intersections of curves. The promise is that they will be related to some uh, interesting problems. The easy one for Goldman brackets, the hard one. For to arrive core brackets, and they will be related to all those structures down there. Maybe we won't be able to discuss all of them, but at least some of them. And uh, the plan for tomorrow is to talk about moduli spaces of flat connections and their symplectic and Poisson structures. And actually, uh, a big thing will be uh, will be this this link. This is also some classical story. And you will be able, I guess you will be able to compare to what uh, Nikolai tells us because he also plans, if I understood correctly, to, to look at the uh, Poisson brackets on the module of flat connections. So you will have a package of two descriptions tomorrow. Okay, I think that's it uh, for today. I will be happy to take questions. Uh, so, uh, um, so do you know some, so I have some, uh, some uh, questions on the chart, whether we know some uh, finite dimensional, some finite dimensional ideals or least of algebras of the Goldman Lee algebra. Uh, ideals, to be honest, I, 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 I don't think so. Um, but, but you know, like maybe you should take my answers with a grain of salt. Lisa algebras, certainly. Think about the following, and this will be important for us. Uh, suppose you have uh, uh, a piece of a surface, or you have, suppose you have uh, two surfaces and an embedding of one surface into the other. So then, um, of course, the fundamental the, there is a map of fundamental groups. There is a map of conjugacy of conjugacy classes, and if you draw uh, your curves on a smaller surface, and you do the Goldman bracket, the Goldman bracket will always be within that smaller surface. So this is uh, uh, a geometric or topological way of obtaining least of algebras, and in fact. We will perhaps we will use it later on in the course, and that's uh, that's some kind of uh, uh, that's uh, 
some, some, some kind of standard way of doing it. So again, uh, um, Nikolai will be talking to us about integrable systems. You can imagine, for instance, uh, looking at some system of curves which do not intersect, right? You can take a surface and draw as many curves as you can, which have no intersections at all, right? This will be an a billion, they will generate an a billion Lisa algebra in the Goldman Lie algebra. So that, that would be another example. Uh, I, uh, uh, I have uh, another question on the chart about involutive. So what's the meaning of uh, involutive? Uh, good point about um, Poisson Lie group. Perhaps I would need to recall what that means. Um, but uh, maybe I can say that we'll need it let's say we will have some geometric, we'll have some geometric interpretation or geometric kind of it will play a role in, uh, in, this, uh, in this part. And in particular in Delta square equals zero. So it will, it will allow to create some kind of operator which squares to zero. And if it's not involved, if it doesn't square to zero, so um, may, may, maybe we'll see it uh, geometrically when we speak about BV, maybe probably at the fourth lecture. Um, yeah, I don't know whether you have any any other questions. Otherwise, so I think I made promises uh, for tomorrow. And uh, maybe one thing is, was it a reasonable tempo? Should we continue like that? Is it like, uh, or should we be slower, faster, and so on? Any feedback on that? The tempo is perfect. Okay, thank you. That's very kind of you. Okay, okay. So then tomorrow we try to continue the same way, and I will be I will be writing uh, on the pad while speaking. Okay. Well. Uh, okay. Then, thank you, Anton. Yeah. Thanks a lot and see you see you tomorrow, people. Oh, thank you, Anton. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, thank you very much. Thank and, you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for participation.